This episode of the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast is brought to you by Anderson Windows. If you're a window installer, you deserve a simple choice. Anderson 400 Series Windows. They're the windows contractors trust the most, based on a 2022 survey of U.S. contractors. Probably because they have fewer callbacks and extra peace of mind. And thanks to shortened lead times, they're available faster. Make your go-to windows Anderson 400 Series. Request a quote at andersonwindows.com. future-proof system uh, instead of making you know just doing exactly what the client wants we we're the the professionals and so we really need to give our advice on making sure they're they're spending the money uh, wisely welcome to the fine home building pro talk podcast a regular discussion with building industry professionals this is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Mike Bennett, a home technology expert from Weston, Connecticut. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast and the original Fine Home Building podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Mike Bennett, thanks so much for being on the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here. Uh, can you please tell me what exactly a uh, home technology expert might be? I think you started out uh, as an electrician, but switched your uh, field of training uh, after you started. Yeah, so I, I started out uh, uh, after high school. I, I deferred from college and I worked at a car stereo shop. I'd always been interested in wiring and everything. And then, uh, you know, I decided that I didn't want to go the college route and went into an electrical apprenticeship. Um, being young and dumb, I, uh, I then changed my mind again, said I wanted to go to school, didn't pan out. And I, I happened to work my way into the audio video um, trade. And that's where I've been since. Uh, so I, I, should have finished up my electrical electrical <laughs> apprenticeship, but um, well, now you're top there, in your field. I guess there's always time. So I mean, uh, you know, there you go. Uh, can I ask you when you started in the field? I'm betting it was a lot different than it is now. Uh, how has the work of a low voltage tech changed in those years? Um, yeah, it, it is much different. When I first started, you know, it was. Uh, when I first started, I was I was essentially hanging TVs and you know running speaker wires for surround sound and and pretty basic stuff. Uh, there were you know big automation systems out there. I I wasn't working for a company that that really did those. They would have been really rare, um, is my guess, right? Yes, they yeah. were they were almost exclusively in in very large homes. Yeah. Um, I used to run some of the wiring for them as as an electrical apprentice. Uh, we would get contracted out to run the wires for the low voltage people in you know in ten fifteen thousand square foot homes. Um, but uh, the biggest thing that's changed is is Wi-Fi and networking and the Internet of Things. Um, right now, you know, uh, my position now I do support for all of uh, my company's larger installs. So I can remotely uh, connect and help and troubleshoot certain problems on their network uh, and with their automation systems, but everything connects to the internet. So it's the, instead of starting with what TVs and speakers and, um, and other things you want, we start with Okay, how do we make the network bulletproof? And so, uh, what kind of things are these folks controlling with these automation systems? Um, it can be literally almost anything. I mean the the typical uh, the typical things you start with the audio and video, um, whether it's you know a one room solution that has. Um, uh, just like a universal type of remote control, the systems that that we do also could be controlled from your your iPhone or iPad. Um, but then, you know, generally you get into the lighting, 
So even if it was just lighting for that one room, let's say it's going to be your, your media room. Um, and, you know, from there, even lighting, you start to go to the outdoor lighting. That way you can create scenes and have timers, um, vacation modes so that lights will turn on and off when you're not home. Uh, and then thermostats. Um, and from there, it's, you know, you can integrate your security system, your pool, your shades. Uh, you could integrate, you know, certain kitchen appliances. It's really, uh, you know, the sky's sort of the limit or, or your budget is the limit <laughs> at that point. <laughs> so there are like, as I understand it, three big companies that kind of, uh, you know, work in this space in the higher end. Um, can you tell me which of those three companies you do most of your work with, or is it vary? Um, so the, the company I work for now, uh, right now we, we use Savant, uh, for automation systems. And then we use Lutron for lighting. Uh, we used to do control four. Uh, I have the most experience with control four. I, I've been doing their systems since 2010. Um, and that's what I have in my home and I have in my parents' homes that I've installed. Um, there, I, they all have their, uh, their strengths and weaknesses. And, uh, I think at the end of the day, it really ends up being, uh, you know, about the installer and the programmer and, and sort of making sure that, you're addressing the client's needs um, and their desires, as well as uh, using best practices. Because, uh, you know, if you don't take those things into account, or if you put together a poorly thought out system, then it's just going to be nothing but headaches, and and the client's never going to want one of these systems again. <laughs> uh, which brings me to my next question, Mike. So uh, I think folks who listen to the show are going to be surprised to hear that you have a full time job and what it amounts to fixing problems with these systems. Are are they unreliable? I mean, are you taking care of a, a dozen clients or is it hundreds? Uh, tell me all about that, if you would. So my position, I. I I think I have less than a hundred clients that I manage remotely. I think right now that I can access remotely, it's somewhere in the sixties. Um, I would say that 90, 90% of my troubleshooting, uh, is, you know, internet and, you know, Wi-Fi based as well as HDMI issues. Um, so when it comes to TVs, everything, you know, when you plug an HDMI cable in from your Apple TV to your TV, it's a standard that should work with everything, but every device has firmware updates. And, and so, especially once you put, uh, something like a surround sound receiver in the middle, things update differently. And sometimes that communication can break down. So, uh, so most of my troubleshooting is not the automation systems themselves. It's, you know, rebooting things like your Apple TV or your TV, uh, or your Wi-Fi. uh, you know, or Wi-Fi calling is a big, uh, a big issue nowadays. Everybody wants to be able to make a call when they don't have service at their house. Um, but it's a very, uh, delicate um, it's a very delicate technology, Wi-Fi calling. Hmm. Uh, so I got to ask, how does one learn how to do this? I'm guessing you have to be largely self-taught, right? Cause this stuff changes so quickly. Yes. Yeah. The, there are, uh, there are lots of, you know, industry courses you can take and lots of manufacturer specific courses. Um, I'm pretty much self-taught. I, I was always a, you know, a hammer and nails type of work with my hands person. Um, that's how I grew up. I, I was out mowing the lawn. I wasn't playing computer games or video games. Um, and so once I got into this industry and I saw the, you know, the programming aspect of everything, 
I realized that that was the the way of the the future as well as that's the way of progressing in my career. Um, and so I, I, you know, for the most part have uh, taught everything to myself by reading, watching videos. Um, but everything changes so quickly that especially now that I don't install the equipment every day, you know, there's a lot of times that I'm going out to troubleshoot something that I have to look up something because I've never even touched the product before. Um, so I got to ask, I bet some uh, folks when they contact you and I'm, I'm guessing it's a phone call oftentimes or probably an email or a text message. I bet they're pretty annoyed. How do you deal with that? Um, it, it is a tough thing and, and it, it is a bit taxing. Um, most of my client interactions are when there's an issue. Um, so it's, it, it, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have a hundred percent, uh, certainty on how I, I mean, I had hair last year. (laughs) Um, um, I, uh, I'm not, I can't tell you exactly how I, I deal with it. I, I know that, you know, the biggest thing is, is trying to pe- uh, keep people calm and assure them that I'm working on the situation, uh, you know, just trying to prioritize getting out there or, you know, because I have remote access to uh, certain things on the client's network, I can tell them, look, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pulling log files from your system and, and I'll send them to the manufacturer and, you know, do you have time tomorrow for me to come out? Um, that's really the, the biggest thing is just, they want to know that you're on it, that you're working on it. Um, and that there's a road to resolution. It's interesting. It's the same thing that, uh, Mike Lombardi, my plumber friend told me is that you can walk people back from the edge if they think you're working on it, uh, versus if you don't hear from them. Right. Right. Yeah. And exactly. And that's, it's. Uh, I've never been the best with, uh, with communication. So it, it is a real struggle for me personally, um, and something that I've gotten much better with, but, uh, but you know, it's something I, I have to actively, um, remind myself and, and tell myself, you know, and, and write myself notes, do what I have to do to ensure that I'm getting back to all these clients. Uh, you told me in an email to the podcast, uh, we should say you're a regular listener and thank you for that. Uh, you had the, you've had the opportunity to travel to some pretty cool places for your job. Can you talk about some of your favorite projects that were away from home? Yeah, I, I, I've done, uh, you know, a handful of projects, uh, away from, you know, the, the tri-state type of area. Uh, one very cool project, uh, with the previous employer was, we had a client that was a, a real techie um, that had a, a house here in Connecticut, but his primary residence was in London. Um, so he uh, flew myself and my boss out to London for a week. Um, and we went and, you know, I basically built the equipment rack and, and started doing all the connections. And uh, he was helping with some of the programming of the system, but um, and then w- we worked with a company that would be taking over to, to help service him. We sort of interviewed a few companies for him, um, that understood, you know, the fact that he, that we gave him the programming software because he's, you know, he's into it and, and capable of, of doing everything. And then we actually went and worked on his, his yacht in France, uh, for a few days after that. Um, spent a night in the port of Monte Carlo. Um, so that, that was probably the most memorable. Um, I'm going to interrupt you down to Florida. I I was going to interrupt you, uh, before we go to other places. But so when you go to London, uh, one of the things about being a good contractor is knowing where to get stuff right. Uh, quickly, what do you do when you're in a foreign country and you need a widget or a tool or, uh, anything? So luckily the, the house was under construction. Um, so the, you know, the electrician was on site. Um, there were some times where I needed little 
things that I was able to get from the electrician. Uh, it was a very, I, I have to say, I was so impressed by the, the, uh, the general contractor, the, the company that was doing the, the project. I mean, the, the, the amount of, you know, protection of walls and floors and, and, you know, everybody wears a safety vest and a hard hat and it was, it was really a well-run operation. Um, I, I probably partly that company, but I think part of it is the standards they, they have over there. Um, so I got lucky in the fact that this wasn't a retrofit type of thing. They had pretty much gutted the, the house, um, but it still was, you know, it, it was interesting. I mean, I, I went over with a, a suitcase that had a few random hand tools and, you know, I, I was trying to install touch panels that, you know, all the walls are plaster and I had to ship some plaster out of these boxes and all I had was a <laughs> screwdriver and my pliers. And so, you know, it was, it, it was certainly interesting. Uh, I, I it's got to add a degree of complication that you wouldn't have if you're working close to home, I'm sure. So you've been to Florida. What were you doing in Florida? Uh, again, the, you know, pretty much all the times I've traveled for work have been clients that have home had homes here and homes down, uh, down South or, or in London. Um, so, you know, typically, uh, in this, in this industry, it's really uh, the way to get ahead is you become your client, you know, that guy or that person for the client. And so the, you know, good clients, uh, you know, especially ones that that do have a bit more money to um, to throw around, they don't want to deal with another person, you know, another set of problems, it, it, even if. Uh, even if you don't reply to them on the first phone call or whatever it is, just like when you hire somebody, you get to know how somebody works. Um, and even if they're not perfect, you know how to deal with them. And these you folks have, the you know, relationships call, with attorneys and accountants. And I'm sure you're uh, the technology team member to this person's enterprise, right? Yeah, I mean, we so for the most part, it, it is interesting that for the most part, um, every every company that I've worked for sticks pretty much to residential. Um, it's it's it, there's a there is a, a definite separation when it comes to uh, enterprise and residential stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but we, we do become sort of like the, the technology concierge, if, if you may, uh, and we will work with, you know, lots of people work from home now. So I can't tell you how many it people, you know, from a client's, uh, business that I have to deal with that, you know, they're setting up, you know, a direct IP phone or, or, you know, a, a virtual private network to their company, so we interface with all sorts of people, um, and it, you know it, it adds some complication to things. So you mentioned earlier that as a kid growing up, you were hands on doing stuff, uh, working. Um, did you also have people who influenced you to uh, join the trade workforce? Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, both of my parents. Uh, I actually have master's degrees. I was my older sister and I are the the only two kids in my entire family, extended family that didn't go to college. Um, uh, my parents said to me, you don't have to go to college. It's not for everybody, but you need to get a license or a certificate, something that that proves you know, you can do a certain job and earn a certain amount of money. Um, but growing up, I, I had, you know, at, at some point, my father got bitten by the uh, the remodeling or addition bug. And uh, although he wasn't 
so hands on. Uh, when I was until I was two, we lived near a guy who was a uh, you know an, an old time contractor, and so he ended up doing all the additions on uh, my childhood home, and he did everything from uh, you know the the concrete block foundation to the framing uh, framing finish carpentry roofing. The only things he didn't do was drywall, electrical, and plumbing, or HVAC. So, you know, I can remember many times throughout different projects as a kid, I would come home, you know, after school, get off the bus, and I'd set my backpack down and put my nail apron on. Hmm. And they would they would essentially leave, you know, a few sheets of the subfloor or a few uh, sheets of sheathing on the wall just nailed off in the corners so that I could finish nailing them off, you know, and, and I can remember getting yelled at for leaving crow's feet when I was setting nails in the, in the built-in cabinets, you know, so, uh, I learned, uh, a lot from, from that, even though I was young and, and not super serious about it, I was always really intrigued, um, and always wanted to, to, work with my hands. Um, so I, it just was sort of a natural progression into it. I think you'd agree. That's a very kind thing to do for a young person. Uh, I bet it would have been easier for them to finish the work. Uh, right. Instead of, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you know, the, unfortunately that, that contractor has since passed away, but you know, he was, he was an old soul. He literally, never touched a nail gun. It was all hammer and nail. Um, and he drew the blueprints. I mean, he did everything and was a wealth of knowledge, but, you know, was essentially a family friend. So a couple nights a week, he would end up staying late and having dinner with, with my family, you know, and he would do things. One of the additions he did, uh, he decided that my father had gotten an architect involved, which he didn't like. So the builder didn't like, or your dad didn't like my, the builder didn't like, because he, he was used to doing his own blueprints. So my father came home and realized that the contractor had changed the design. Um, it was a, uh, like a great room we were doing off the back of the house and he made the outside corners angled instead of straight. And my, you know, my father questioned him on it and he said, it's better. And it was fantastic. I mean, it really, it, it really, I can't imagine that room without that detail. Um, but it was one of those situations where he, you know, he knows what's best and, and he was close enough with us that he figured what's the worst that that's going to happen. Um, but, uh, what but, I yeah, find really interesting, interesting about that is he made the room harder to build. Like, <laughs> it's like yeah. most builders want to, uh, you know, economize, simplify, but he knew he had an aesthetic, uh, consideration too. Right. And, you know, he, he was the same guy that, uh, I, somewhere, I think I have an old picture, but there was the back wall had some custom arched windows over over the top of, you know, there were casement windows down low and those arched windows were the way he did the measurements. It's all, if you were to rip up the, the oak flooring on the subfloor, it's drawn out to scale and designed <laughs> right there on the plywood subfloor. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. You mentioned also in your email that low voltage installers and equipment can do real damage to building envelopes and control layers. Can you talk about that a little, please? Yeah. So, you know, it's something that once I started getting into the, the building science stuff, once I started listening to the podcast, uh, you know, I realized how, uh, how damaging, uh, you know, so much of my trade is done after the fact. So there's so much old work being done, you know, and when, uh, when I go to a 
troubleshoot. Let's say I have to pull a, a plate off the wall by a TV. I, you know, I could tell you that nine times out of 10, if it's an existing house and it's an exterior wall, before I pull the plate off, I can feel the wind coming through. Um, and it's just, it's one of those things where, yeah, you're, you know, you have to snake wires to it. So you're going to damage insulation. Um, you're going to cut the, the, um, you know, the, the vapor barrier or vapor retarder on the, if it's paper faced insulation, you know, and even the best and most cautious installer, you're never going to be able to put that insulation back exactly when reaching through a, a one gang hole. Right. Um, you know, and same thing goes for if you're doing speaker outdoor speakers or something, um, you know, you're drilling through the siding and you put some silicone on it, but you know, you try to drill at an upward angle, but just doing that is not the, the greatest way, you know, in a, in a perfect world, uh, you know, you'd get a contractor to cut the siding out, put a piece of PVC trim as a mounting block with, you know, proper flashing and, and the works. But, you know, unfortunately it just, it, it doesn't happen, um, all that often, unless you're on a new build. I, uh, totally uh, so. have drilled holes for adding electrical receptacles, uh, and, uh, outdoor speakers, just like you describe. Um, I think the uh, money is not often there to, to do it the right way. Uh, uh, I have no excuse, but uh, <laughs> I'm guessing a lot of it comes from uh, just folks in the low voltage trade are not trained in building science or envelopes. Uh, do you think that should be part of the uh, training for folks who do this kind of work? I mean, I, I think that the training for every trade needs to include um, you know, some sort of training on, on the building envelope and, and air tightness now, um, you know, even electricians or plumbers or whoever, you know, I don't think it should be fully on the contractor to go back and, uh, make sure that, you know, you're putting great stuff around the, the boxes that go to outside or, you know, any kind of, uh, flashing penetrations. I, I think that, we all need to be responsible for, uh, you know, to an extent responsible for our penetrations and what we do. Um, but I also think that it's low voltage is, it can be a bit tricky because in lots of parts of the country, um, it's not even something that needs to necessarily be licensed. Uh, you need to have a license to do and or, you know, when you're retrofitting, there's tons of guys out there that mount TVs and, you know, run the wires through the wall, you know, down to your cabinet without any kind of license, you know, and, you know, hopefully they have insurance. But um, so there, there's a lot of retrofit applications where there aren't permits pulled. It's not licensed contractors. Um, and I think that's the that's the most dangerous. Um, but there should be more education for all. Have you seen problems from, you know, bad installs like, you know, moisture problems or, uh, you know, uh, rot when you peek inside a, you know, old work box to, uh, make a change or what have you? Yeah, I, I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen catastrophic issues. I haven't, you know, pulled out an old work box and put my hand through paper mache that used to be OSB, uh, at, at least at a, at a client's house. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, there, there are plenty of times where I, you know, I could pull a, a device out, you know, like, uh, a doorbell or we, we use door stations like video doorbells, you know, and there's a monstrous cutout. And you could see all the spider webs and you could see the, the air flowing in and out and all the insulation around it has been pushed away. And so you could start seeing a little bit of mold and a little bit of rot. And it's just there, there is no reason to leave it in that state. Um, 
You also mentioned that uh, a reasonable amount of future proofing makes it more likely that a home won't need upgrades that can damage control layers. Uh, and you you mentioned fire controlled assemblies, right? You you can't just go drilling holes in a in a multifamily building. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, so even even in a uh, even in a single family, right? When if you're doing an addition or any kind of uh, renovation and you're pulling permits, if if you have an electrical or a plumbing permit, uh, before you you go and uh, do you know, your insulation or drywall, the rough electrical inspection is looking for fire caulk, right? Or the rough plumbing in inspection is looking for fire caulk. So when you're doing this as a retrofit, there there really isn't, uh, there A, there isn't a good way to stick a caulk gun into a single gang hole that, you know, that is 12 inches down to the, to the bottom plate or, especially if you're using longer flex bits. So I think they're, you know, we're opening up uh, potential issues. I mean, there's a reason for fire caulk and that's to, to keep a uh, certain uh, time that people have to get out of a home before the fire spreads. So, and especially with newer building materials, TJIs, um, stuff like that, they, you know, once fire gets to a TJI, it's OSB. It's it's going up quick. Um, so, you know, I think we we all as professionals and homeowners and and handymen need to think about that and need to say, okay, well, I know it's it's better for the client to cut a single gang hole and do our work, and that way it can be, you know, we're going to plate it off afterwards so they won't have any patching to do. But what if we just cut a bigger hole and you have to tape and paint that one little spot? At least then you can get a caulk gun down. You can make sure that you're actually sealing the penetration. Um, and down the road, I mean, it, it, could, uh, it could save someone's life. We should mention you know a little bit about this because you were also a volunteer firefighter. Uh, <laughs> have you seen uh, evidence of uh, uh, bad contracting affecting uh, building assemblies in your work as a firefighter? No. So luckily, the fire department, uh, the fire department I'm on, is not a super busy department. It's a small town. Uh, we don't generally get you know, lots of house fires. So I'm, I'm lucky that I have not seen it. Um, but I've seen as a, as a contractor, I've seen plenty of times where I go into, you know, even an exposed basement or attic and you can see all the old work, uh, stuff that has been done that has no fire caulking on penetrations. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, th there's a there's a valid reason to do it, um, and not doing it, you're really taking a uh, a risk. You mentioned that uh, you know future proofing can prevent some of the, you know, holes uh, that we're talking about. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, uh, like I said, when you know, if you're snaking wires in an existing building. Uh, especially an exterior wall, you're you're going to damage that insulation, right? You could damage the the WRB depending on on where you're snaking, or you could damage the the paper face uh, uh, vapor control layer. But either way, there's damage that you're you're not going to be able to fix unless you open that wall up. So when you're building a house or, or building a new room, running a few extra wires that are not that expensive uh, or even putting a conduit in place can save you know, time, money, and protect that investment that you made in, in that building. So you know, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't even have to be for some big whole home system. It, it may be your living room, you know, it, uh, say you, you're going to want to mount a TV on the wall someday, 
maybe you just run a, a small conduit from, you know, outlet height, a box there up to where the TV would be. Um, and that way you don't have to worry about snaking later on. You push the wires right up or down that, that conduit. You, um, probably are the best person to answer this question, but like, so, you know, we used to say, uh, you run a conduit from the basement up to the attic so you can do whatever, uh, changes electrical or low voltage you want in the future. But of course that's a chimney for fire spread. Uh, is that a viable solution? Are there ways you can make a conduit that connects your levels of your house safer? Yeah, I mean, I um, I did that at, at my house from my crawl space to my bedroom attic. I kind of have a, a funky split level. Um, so I, I did it because I was uh, I ended up spray foaming the first uh, floor portion of the house of the house. Um, I have one for low voltage, one for line voltage and. Uh, again, things like fire caulk, um, you're, you know, in terms of, of uh, creating a fire stop, it, it's much more concerning to have open places where, where air, you know, and therefore flames can spread than it is to have a blocked off section. So, you know, you can always chip out the fire caulk later on and, then, you know, install more if you need to add another wire. But I, I think that's a, a great thing, especially if you have an accessible attic. Um, you know, it, it say you want to do cameras or any, you know, anything on the second floor, you can very easily then branch out from there. Um, and it's, it's a great way to uh, leave access. Um, how big, how big a conduit are we talking about? Is it two inches is two inches enough? Is that too big? Uh, I mean, I think it really depends. I think that if you have a, you know, if you have a small ranch, right there, you know, especially like a one story or something, if you have attic access, you know, running, I don't know, let's say if you ran two one inch conduits, it, in terms of the low voltage side, you'd be able to put a lot through that. And even line voltage, I'm not sure how much you would really need to add. Um, if it's a 10,000 square foot house, that's, you know, three floors and a basement, uh, you know, that that's a different story. Um, and I think to an extent, you're typically limited uh, on spaces you can easily run that. Because of the depth uh, of the stud cavity, you know, right? You'd like it to be... Right. And you'd like it to be as straight as possible. So, you know, a lot of times you don't necessarily have that straight run. But if you could run two two inch conduits, that would be probably the ideal thing. Would if, you know, say uh, we could generate the Mike Bennett uh, standard of low voltage wiring, would you want people to include a, a conduit connecting levels for future upgrades changes? I, I think it would be, it would be great. I mean, if, if you found a closet in each, you know, in each level type of thing, or, um, or if you did have, you know, say it's, say it's a two floor house with a basement and attic. Yeah. I mean, if you had a conduit going from the basement to the attic, uh, you could essentially then, between access from the basement and access from the, the attic, reach anywhere on either floor uh, if the basement was unfinished. So that would be sort of ideal, you know. But the other thing is, even just running certain wires or a conduit to certain places. If if you have one main living room, right, that's probably where you're your main TV will be. So maybe you run a conduit or you just run a few cat sixes or, or even now, you know, you could run fiber optic to that location and you'll be there, you know, you'll be good for the next, I'm not sure how many years, but more than 10, 15. Um, 
you just I, I wouldn't say that you're prepared if you run an HDMI cable through the wall. Can you do field terminations on HDMI cables or do they have to have ends? I think it's the latter, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so I, I never recommend unless it's a, a local run, you know, in one stud uh, bay, I never recommend running an actual HDMI cable. Um, if it's longer than 15 feet total, then it really should be done with a, an HDMI extender, which would use cat six or cat six a um or they also now have them for fiber optic and there's fiber available that uh is much easier to terminate than not it still takes special tools but uh it takes some of the steps out of the process so it doesn't require years and years of of training so most low voltage contractors nowadays are are if they haven't gotten into it they're getting into it now. they're gonna need to i think um, it's fair to but say. again right and yeah and and we're talking about future proofing so even you know if you get a contractor who can run it you don't necessarily need to use it tomorrow um, but 15 years from now when you get your new 32k tv that fiber optic should have plenty of bandwidth they can, you know, everybody will, there'll be a do it yourself termination kit at that point. Um, <laughs> and you'll be able to do it yourself and, and not have to run a new wire. So, how does a home builder or remodeler or even a homeowner know if their low voltage contractor is a good one? Uh, I mean, I think that, again, word of mouth when it comes to, to, this industry is is really big. Um, uh, you know, the the good companies tend to have a client base that ends up ends up being like a big family because you know you get a good client and then his buddy, you know, or her her friend and and so it everyone ends up sort of knowing each other if you're if you're good. Um, you know, if you don't have if if you don't know somebody who's worked with them, you know, you can do your research. I, I think the biggest thing is if you're looking to have something done, you know, ask for you know as specific as you can uh, in what they're looking to do. If they're more focused on the product and not the infrastructure, then I would be concern. I, I think that the responsible thing is to tell you, I know you want that 75 inch TV and I know you want, you know, whatever it is you want, but if we go a model, you know, lower on your TV and your speakers and everything, we can then make sure your network is, is robust. We can make sure that you have all the wiring for the future um, and give you a, a better overall um, and future-proof system uh, instead of making, you know, just doing exactly what the client wants. We, we're the, the professionals, and so we really need to give our advice on making sure they're, they're spending the money uh, wisely. You know, when I, when I go to a construction site, I, I feel like I can tell – if the electrician or plumber are good, oftentimes by the quality of the work, how, how much care they put into running the pipes or wires. Are there similar clues that someone can see with a low vol voltage installation to know if someone who did this cared about their job? Absolutely. Um, it's, the, it's the same, uh, it's, it's similar to an electrician. Um, I, I'm one of those people that you know, as as an electrical apprentice, um, and one of the companies I worked for, you know, for years in the low voltage industry, we we did both low and high voltage. So I've I've you know programmed and installed many lighting systems and and all that. But you know, I, I can't stand to see a twist in in Romax, right? Um, unless it's specifically <laughs> supposed to be there. So. Um, uh, you know, the same thing goes for low voltage. It's 
all the workmanship should be neat. Everything, you know, there shouldn't be big sags in a cable between staples. Uh, the other thing is, you know, a, uh, somebody who really cares when you're running things like cat six for ethernet or even fiber optic, you have to be very careful using zip ties and staples. Um, because if you kink or compress that wire too much, um, you can significantly reduce the bandwidth, the amount of data that can pass. So if, if you were to see kinks in cables or really tight staples, that, that person just, you know, isn't, uh, isn't treating it with care. Um, and then on the finishing side or the remodel side, the company I work for now, no installers have a pencil. Every installer has blue, uh, blue tape and Sharpies because you never draw on a wall. You put tape on the wall and then use Sharpie and the Sharpie won't go through, but that way, if, if they have to lay out a speaker or, you know, a hole for a, a low voltage box, if they mark it out and then they use a stud finder and realize that, you know, they have to move it, they don't have to go and try and erase or, or paint over um, pencil marks. That's right? a simple and, thing, but you know, my gosh, blankets. what a big difference that would make uh, instead of trying to get rid of a big square or circle drawn on the ceiling, right? There's no way you're going to make that completely go away. Right. Yeah. And just, you know, putting blankets down in your work area. We, we always, you know, unless we're in a, in a construction zone or on a ladder, we wear booties on our, on our shoes. I mean, it's just, it's simple things that if, if the contractor is taking care of your house, um, and, and your, you know, property, then, you know, they're, they're probably going to be doing a, a good job. That's, I mean, it's more common sense stuff than anything specific. Do you see big disparity in the, what people charge for low voltage services? Is it a big spread? I hear amongst good contractors and other trades that it's often pretty close, but without licensing, without uh, you know, some kind of market force, um, I would suspect it would be uh, easier to have a bigger spread in a, in a trade where there wasn't um, the degree of control that there might be in other trades. Yeah, I mean, there. so there definitely is a spread, but uh, it's almost, you're not really talking about the same uh service or the same quality of, of service. So, you know, the, the guy who advertises on Craigslist to, you know, that he mounts TVs or cameras or whatever it is, you know, they, those are quick jobs. They're not, you know, you're not writing out a big contract, uh, you know, generally fixed price type of thing. You're, you're getting what you, what you pay for, uh, uh, a company that does larger installs, larger systems, you're paying for the fact that they, you know, their employees all have, you know, uniforms. Uh, they have clean work vehicles. The, you know, they have insurance. The consumable parts, uh, like I said, we, you know, things that aren't necessarily charged for are, are things like zip ties or for for my company. The only time to use zip ties is potentially when you're pre-wiring but other than that it's all velcro um so velcro wrap so you don't have to go and sit there and and cut a bunch of uh zip ties in order to change a piece of equipment out you undo velcro things like that are, are expensive and so um you, you typically get what you pay for and, and you're getting guys you know I, i'm not cheap but my company values it and you know, the other companies that I would go to, um, you know, they they have to be charging enough to justify having somebody this experienced instead of, you know, a guy for 20 bucks an hour that can, you know, mount TVs and, and install speakers and run wires, but isn't, you know, can't run a job. It sounds like every other trade, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty much. Yeah. 
Um, so this is my favorite part of the show, as you likely know. Uh, the email you sent to the podcast email box indicated you were quite the home building enthusiast. Can you talk about your own house, when you got it, what it's like, what you've done to it? Uh, sure. I don't think we have time for the whole story, <laughs> but uh, I bought my house uh, just over six years ago. Um, you know, it's an older, uh, it's a 1962, uh, sort of a split level. And it, you know, home inspection checked out okay. There were a couple little things here and there. Um, uh, there was a brand new coat of paint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and unfortunately, that hid, hid lots of stuff. So, you know, I at this point, I've essentially redone the entire outside of the house. So all new sheathing, all new siding. Um, most of the main house is all zip R, uh, zip R 6.6. What is that? The one inch thick one? Bats. Uh, the one inch thick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then R 15, uh, rock wool, uh, was retrofit from the outside into the, spaces after we ripped out what, you know, what was left of the fiberglass. Um, uh, and then, you know, all new windows and I have, uh, a combination of, of hardy plank and, uh, LP smart side, um, uh, like panel siding. Was your so house originally T111, the, the outside, uh, Mike? So the, the main house was cedar clapboard, but like eight, like somewhere around nine inch. I think it was around an eight inch reveal um, cedar, which when I, when I started doing the, the necessary project, which was in the back, um, I, I looked at prices of that and said that wasn't happening. Last um, I remember, it was like three bucks a I, foot. I went... <laughs> Very yes, yeah. it, it was not, yeah, it was not cheap. And, you know, as much as I wanted to try and save it, it just, you know, it's, it's old and dry and, and removing it in one piece was, uh, I, I would have paid more in the labor to try and do so than it was worth. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, the, the whole outside is, uh, is finished. I still have a, you know, old bathrooms and kitchen, um, but, the, you know, I, I would say the biggest issue I had was I have a large raised deck that is also a two car carport. And when I, when I moved in, uh, you know, I, I didn't think any, anything of the fact that there, there was rolled roofing, uh, to keep water off the, the cars underneath. Lo and behold, that row, the rolled roofing went up the wall um, of the house about two inches, which was lower than the decking. And then they had caulked the decking to the siding. And, and so I ended up having the entire wall beneath, uh, was paper mache <laughs> with, uh, you know, some large, uh, holes under the decking where mice were getting in. And here and there you could see uh, cobbled in little pieces of, uh, new pressure treated two by for the, uh, for the bottom plate where, you know, they had patched some things in. So that was an experience. Uh, you know, I, I gutted the entire room, built a double stud wall on one side and, you know, did spray foam and, uh, the whole deal. So I I've seen a lot here. Uh, I'm definitely into it for more than, uh, I should be, but at the end of the day, I said, you know what, I want to stay here. I bought here for a reason. So, you know, it, it's not something, you know, I wouldn't have done it this way if I was going to flip the house. That's for sure. I would have done the kitchen and, uh, you know, I probably would have saved on not doing zip R. <laughs> So, so, uh, obviously this was more than you bargained for, but, but do you like the work generally? Do you like working on your house? Do you like working on the uh, other trades that you don't do every day? 
Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, most of what I do now for work is behind a computer. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, I can't wait to put my, my ripped pants on and, and go outside, go to, you know, I'm slowly organizing my, uh, detached garage as a shop. Um, and I love outdoor projects. I have a, I have a four wheel drive tractor with a loader and I, I burn a lot of firewood. I, I do all my own tree work. So I, I, you know, I, anything to work with my hands, uh, whether it's carpentry or landscaping or whatever it is, is, uh, you know, I, I like to do it. You told me yesterday that you were, uh, unexpectedly at home awaiting your delivery of your new sauce sop. What did, what did you buy? Uh, so I finally bit the bullet and, and got a saw stop, uh, the contractor saw as much as I, I've always wanted a cabinet saw, but a, I, I just don't have the, the room for it yet. I have, uh, my shop is essentially two car, but I have stuff in it and there's posts in the middle. Yeah. Eventually I'll put a beam in and, um, and you know, just also the, saw stop is very, very expensive as it is. So for what I do, I couldn't justify getting something bigger. Uh, but I got the 36 inch T glide fence. Um, I got to a point with my old Delta contractor saw that I just couldn't adjust it any further. I drilled out the trunnions and, uh, it just, it really was out of, it, uh, out of the ability to adjust and it also didn't have any safety features, didn't have a riving knife. So I, I figured it was, you know, it was time to upgrade. But uh, I'm pretty excited. That'll be, uh, it'll be a fun weekend finishing, setting that thing up and trying it out. I've heard folks say that, uh, and you can imagine these folks, you've probably worked with a number of them, uh, say things like, uh, if, if you know how to use a table saw, you don't need a saw stop. What would you say to that person? Like, what made you spend extra money for that safety feature? So, you know, part, part of it was the, the safety feature. Uh, I like my, my fingers. You know, I, <laughs> I work with them, uh, whether it's on the computer or, uh, or in the field. So I, I think the safety feature is, is part of it, but I'm also admittedly too much of a perfectionist. And so I really like the idea of a, just a really well built saw that I can make sure is, is, you know, as accurate as I need it for what I want it to be. Um, and I, I've never, I've just never had that. And I figured if I'm going to invest in, in the money, why not invest something in something that, uh, is that, but, also will not cut my finger off, you know? Um, yeah. Did you Hopefully, think about it? I mean, did, I'm hoping it won't. Did you, I'm sure you like, you know, went to the websites and you're like, Oh my God, I could have so much more saw for the same amount of money. I bet you did. Right. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And you know, I, the other thing is I, I'm not somebody who's against buying used. I mean, my mm -hmm. Delta contractor saw I bought used, you know, and, and I got a great deal on it and, you know, a bunch of fancy blades. I, I, w before I bought that saw, I didn't know you could get blades sharpened mm -hmm. until I talked with the guy I bought it from. And, and he said, yeah, these are $150 blades. Uh, and, you know, so I, I looked at, at older, uh, you know, older unisaws and, and stuff like that. But, you know, you're, when you're you're going to spend a thousand fifteen hundred dollars to me once I, you know unless i'm spending 500 versus 3000 uh i i sort of felt like it's just silly not to get that safety feature um yeah i i, I don't know something i you know maybe it's me just getting older and being a little more aware of safety um but yeah, I, once I decided that I was going to upgrade, I decided it wasn't it wasn't worth upgrading to anything else. 
I think you're smart. You know, I've met a lot of carpenters who are missing fingers and it's, uh, I don't mean to make it sound like I'm taking it lightly, but it's, it's just a fact of life. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Mike, in all sincerity. Uh, is there anything you'd like to ask or tell our audience before we go? I think that, uh, you know, I, I certainly am, you know, here as a resource, uh, you know, you have my contact info. I, I'd love to, you know, write in, answer any questions that, that do come up uh, for readers. You know, there's there are a lot of resources out there on technology uh, in general, but, you know, I think um, using just, you know, good judgment and best practices uh, in the industry, you know, can make sure that we're not harming a home uh, and that we're doing the right thing when we're, you know, building something new or, or adding on to a building. Well, I will tell folks uh, right now that uh, you sent some stuff over ahead of the show. Uh, we're trying to get a feature article for Fine Home Building going together, and uh, it's amazing. It's great. So listen and look for that, folks, because we're going to hear more from Mike. Well, thank you. And I hope folks will take you up on your offer to answer their questions, because uh, I know a lot about different aspects of home building, but I know nothing about what you do. So uh, we definitely need an expert in that regard. I'm happy to help. Oh, that was great. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Mike Bennett for joining us, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to FHB Podcast at Taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Happy building. Happy building.